What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of the sit down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think of today's discussion in the comment section below. Here on a Saturday, if we get to 1,000 likes, I'm going to give one lucky commenter a cash prize. So make sure you like, you comment, you get involved in the discussion. The quicker we get there, the quicker we give some money away. If you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet. Are we living on a rock and seeing this video for the first time? I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit-down video today. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get in to another very interesting organized crime topic. And we have heard many individuals associated with the mafia over the years, and whether they are associates, made men, or high-ranking members. Some of them have come on YouTube and have spewed about their crimes. People like Sammy Gravano, Mikey Scars, John A. Light, and Gene Borello. On this very channel, Gene Borello has spoken about his crimes. And one of the people he has brought up is a man they call Ronnie G. Ronnie G, he would claim, was his mentor, Gene Borello, in getting involved in his associate of the mafia. What do we know about Ronald G. Alonzo? Not much. Today we're going to talk about him. Ronnie G. next on the sit down. Ronald G. Alonzo was born in June of 1970 in Queens, New York. He would come up in the bucolic neighborhood of Howard Beach. Now, for anyone that is not that familiar with Howard Beach, Howard Beach is a beautiful neighborhood, okay? It is something that borders the water. It looks like a short town, basically, if you've ever been to South Jersey. But it is full of plenty of Italians, plenty of Irish. There's a lot of storefronts and restaurants. And it just seems like a really nice place to grow up. Now, one thing we know about Howard Beach is it is for a long period of time been involved with the mafia. We know that coming up, John Gotti uh, would eventually move to Howard Beach and his family still lives there today, and most notably his wife. We know that Junior Gotti discussed Howard Beach growing up. I'm from Howard Beach. You know, we've seen that 60 Minutes episode. Howard Beach has always been involved with the mafia, and it's where Ronnie G would cut his teeth as a youngster. Now, Ronald G. Alonzo is the nephew of Bonanno powerhouse Vincent Vinny Asaro. Now, we know through a video that we did on Vinny Asaro, he has been involved with the mafia for many, many lineages. His father, his grandfather, his um, family has always been around the mob. And Vinny had been quoted as saying many times that his goal was to continue to keep the bloodlines in the mafia alive, bringing new members in. And that would include people like his nephew, who we'll get into his rise in a minute. But I want to first discuss, as I said, Howard Beach has always been very Italian, very Irish, very white, right? We all know that. And Howard Beach over the years has been embroiled in a lot of racial tension, okay? If you've ever heard of about 15 years ago, there was a case of a person uh, being beaten with a baseball bat by an Italian named Fat Nick Minucci. That was a big national story. Minucci's uh, recently got out of prison. But in the 80s, in 1986, in December of that year, a Trinidadian, a Trinidadian man that had moved to New York, a person called Michael Griffith, was killed in Howard Beach. And this would set a lot of racial tension in the area. Essentially, what would happen is on the night of December 20th, 1986, Michael Griffith, alongside two other black males, were in Howard Beach after it was discussed that Griffith was going there to pick up a paycheck. From what I understand, it was said that his car broke down and they ended up stopping at a pizzeria in the area of Cross Bay Boulevard and 157th Avenue called New Park Pizza. And about 10 minutes later, they would leave the pizzeria to which a large group of white males would begin beating them, okay? And at one point, they beat Griffith so bad that he ended up 
finding a way to get up, but stumbled into oncoming traffic, was hit by a car and killed. Okay. Now, if you've ever seen uh, a Bronx tale, it was similar in a way to that beating, right? This would result, though, in a death down the road, multiple individuals, including uh, this person, John Riley, uh, was arrested. Many people were arrested. Uh, and ultimately, some of them would end up going to prison for a long period of time. This would set up a lot of tension in the neighborhood. Al Sharpton would show up. This would happen a lot. This happened in Brooklyn, too. There were a lot of these racial kind of uh, cases. Now, I relate this to this situation because at 16 years old, in the year of 1987, a young Ronnie Gialonzo was quoted in an article from the Washington Post written by a person called Michael Dobbs. In that piece, Michael Dobbs would head to Howard Beach and understand the lay of the land and what kind of neighborhood it actually was. Now, we know this is Ronnie Gialonzo due to the fact that in the same article, his dear friend Richie Kessler was mentioned as well. They had been boyhood friends. And Kessler was also quoted in the piece. Now, in the piece about Howard Beach and the involvement of Howard Beach youths in killing Michael Griffith, Ronnie Gialonzo was quoted as saying once, quote, it could have been any of us. I don't like blacks. It was just an ordinary fight. I heard that Griffith got hit and ran away. They didn't mean to kill him. Now, Gialonzo would also state that he dropped out of high school because he didn't like blacks. Now, at one point, Ronnie G would also discuss the lay of the land in high school, in high school in Ozone Park. He would say, quote, the blacks hung at the front, the whites on the side, the Puerto Ricans at the back. Gialonzo would also state, quote, I hate black people. I always will. I'm prejudiced. And I'm proud of it. He would also state that he was half Italian and half Jewish and that he would, quote, beat any black who ventured into the deli they were in during the interview. Then at that point, he would also notice in the back of the store a black employee called Charlie who hands out quarters for the games. The Gialonzo, after saying he didn't like black people, wandered over to Charlie and say, quote, I wouldn't pick on Charlie, though. He's my only black friend. Besides, he's bigger than me. So kind of an interesting look into the young mind of Ronald Gialonzo. Now, I want to explicitly state Ronnie Gialonzo was just 16 years old. I'm not making excuses for him now. I don't know how he feels about black people in his 50s. But this is a very interesting look into the mind of a young man in Howard Beach. Like I said, though, he was 16, but we can imagine he probably still harbors some of these uh, opinions. Now, throughout the late 80s and into the 90s, Ronnie G would continue running the streets. And by the mid 90s, he would begin to be schooled by his uncle, Vinny Asaro, in the many haunts and illegal rackets of the mafia. By the late 90s, it was reported that Ronnie Gialonzo was a big-time loan shark, and he was making big money for his uncle, Vinny Asaro. By 1998, it has been widely reported that Vinny Asaro would make Ronnie G a made man. He would be sponsored and entered into a life in the mafia. Now, upon his making ceremony in the late 90s, it was reported by the early 2000s he would be placed in the crew of Vinny Asaro's son, Jerome Jerry Asaro. Now, at the time, Jerry Asaro would have his own father in his crew, as well as other people, including Vito Grimaldi. Now, Ronnie G, by this point, was a very accomplished loan shark. He had many people in his group, his crew. And they were making a lot of money. Look, the truth is, one thing we know about Vinny Asaro, he was a degenerate gambler. His kid, Jerry Asaro, was a captain. And when you're in that life, you are called upon to kick up. Okay, and Vinny Asaro, they needed the money. 
Ronnie was one of his top earners. Ronnie was dabbling in not only loan sharking, but extortion, bookmaking, and drug dealing. And the people around him were all very much a part of that. I want to talk about some of the members of the crew that the soldier Ronnie Gialonzo had. One of them was Robert Pisani. Now, it has been reported that Robert Pisano, for a long period of time, was a big-time bookmaker and at one point owned a deli that we will talk about. Pisani would end up being a very important part of all of this that we talk about over the next 10 or so minutes. Now, his crew would also include Michael Palmacio, who would end up becoming an enforcer, collector, and many other things for Vinny Asaro and Ronnie Gialonzo. Also in the crew was Gene Barello. And we'll get into Gene Barello's many exploits here as well. Also was Nicholas Pudgy Festa. Festa was a high-level drug dealer and loan shark. Also in the crew was Michael Padavonia and a person called Evan the Jew Greenberg. Now, I was unable to find a photo of Evan Greenberg, but one thing I would find out about Greenberg is he was very destructive in some of the comments he made, which we'll get into in just a second. Things were good for uh, uh, the Ronnie Gialonzo. Here he can be seen talking with members of the Colombo crime family, and to his left, is Nicholas Pudgy Festa. Now, by 2005, the Gialonzo crew was in a beef. They had a major problem. Now, Festa would go to Gialonzo to uh, whine and complain that m multiple individuals were robbing him. He had been robbed several times, and he would go to Gialonzo and state that he pretty much knew who it was, and that he assumed it was a one-man crime wave, if you will, a kid that was running the streets of Ozone Park in Howard Beach called Chris, Crazy Chris Cognata. Now, Cognata in his own right um, was a bit of a familiarity to someone like Omar Little. From what I understand, Cognata was robbing drug dealers. He was just doing what he wanted to do, and he was running the streets, and no one was able to get rid of him. Gialonzo would approach Cognata and ask him if he had robbed uh, Festa and his crew, to which Cognata would respond that he did not rob him. The problem is Ronnie Gialonzo didn't agree and didn't believe him. He would then order multiple individuals to shoot Cognata but not kill him. One of the people that he had tasked in hurting Cognata was allegedly Gene Borello, and Michael Palmacio. Now, Palmacio and Borello at one point would spot Mr. Cognata outside of resident and where residence and where they believed he was living. They would then wait for him to come outside. They would then be get uh, be given guns by allegedly Gialonzo, in which they waited for him to come out. After hours of waiting for Cognata. Gene Barella and Paul Macy would get back into the car and would leave the area. Now, on another occasion, Paul Macio and Barella would spot Chris Cognata with his girlfriend in a car, to which Barella would pull a gun and walk towards Cognata as he exited a car. He would then shoot at Cognata, grazing his arm, and then... Uh, Cognata's girlfriend would then strike Gene Barella with her vehicle and speed off. Now, after the incident, Barella would report to Gialonzo that Cognata had been shot, but he wasn't killed. Now, ultimately, Chris Cognata would not die. He would die many years later. And due to the fact that Ronnie Gialonzo ended up going to prison, that may have saved Cognata's life even initially. In 2006, though, Ronnie Gialonzo would be hit with an extortion rap from the federal government and be sentenced. He would go to prison and be released in 2013 on supervised release. Upon his release, Ronald Gialonzo would begin working, allegedly, at this deli. Now, at the time, it was not called the Channel Market. It was called the All-American Deli. Now, luckily for Gialonzo, he would be given a job for supervised release because his old friend, Robert Pisani, owned the deli. Now, 
many people believe he didn't actually work there. He was just inside hanging out. And that would be where people would come and drop off loan payments and all sorts of other things. Remember, Robert Pisani is a convicted bookmaker and he was actively engaging in bookmaking and kicking up to Ronnie G. Alonzo. Now, I want to talk a little bit about how big of a loan shark Ronald G. Alonzo was. It was estimated that for years on end, Ronnie G. Alonzo had up to three million dollars on the street at one time and he would use people like Evan Greenberg and Gene Barello and Michael Paul Maceo to collect on those loans remember if you have 30 or not 30 three million dollars on the street I mean on a weekly basis you're making tens of thousands of dollars just in interest on those loans that doesn't count all the other things these guys are doing this would make Ronnie G Alonzo a very rich individual now by 2014, it was alleged that Ronnie G would actually take over the crew of Jerry Asaro and would become a captain in the Bonanno crime family. Now, we know that as well due to the fact that in 2015, Ronnie G. Alonzo would be spotted at an all-captains meeting in a garage in Queens to vote on making Joe Camerano the acting boss of the Bonanno crime family. He would be spotted at that meeting alongside other high-ranking members of the Bonanno crime family. Now, again, once Ronnie gets out of prison by that point, things are going good. He's a captain. He's making a lot of money. Um, things are really going well for him. And as I said, by this point, Ronnie G becomes a very rich individual. So what does he do? A king needs his castle, right? Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about the palatial monstrosity that Ronnie G ultimately builds. We have talked many times on this channel about some of the things gangsters do that really piss the government off. And one of the biggest things that an individual in the mafia has ever done to piss the government off was committed by Ronald G. Alonzo. Now, from his dear friend, Robert Pisani, Ronnie G. Alonzo would buy a property located in Howard Beach from Robert Pisani. The location of this place was 16404 86th Street in Howard Beach. Now, it was a nice piece of property. It was a corner property. It was an 80 by 100 lot. And Ronnie G didn't like the house that was on it, which, again, nice little house. But Ronnie G wanted more. So in turn, he puts a ton of money into rehabbing the house. And it turns into this. Now, again, this is a palatial monstrosity. We can say it. It's very out there, especially when you look at the other homes in the area. It's on the corner. It sticks out. We can admit it is a beautiful home. Now, according to the FBI, we would find out that Ronnie G would give Robert Pisani about $700,000 in cash, as well as wipe away an over $300,000 debt that Mr. Pisani had owed to Mr. G. Alonzo. Now, the G. Alonzo uh, husband and wife, Ronnie and his wife, would take out, allegedly, a mortgage as well for this property. So there was a lot that went into this thing. But I want to talk a little bit about the home itself. And I have to admit, it is beautiful. Now, it boasts not one but two fireplaces, a surround sound system throughout the home, as well as a very nice gym. And interestingly enough, in that gym, now I know it's hard to see, but on the back wall, you can see a sign that says, only the strong survive. Now, in the home as well, in the gym, you can find weights, barbells, exercise machines, as well as a high ceiling uh, finish. So as a full kitchen, media room, built-in fish tank, a wine room, and a seated closet. Now, in the home itself, you can find some other beautiful amenities, including a gourmet eat-in kitchen with a large island, top-of-the-line appliances, a banquet-sized dining room, as well as radiant heat throughout the home, three full bathrooms, and two half baths, as well as the basement, which has tile heated floors. Now, you can also find uh, this uh, beautiful uh, living room, uh, equipped with that fish tank that I talked about. Nice big TV. In fact, there were multiple 
uh, beautiful couches. Uh, you can also find in the backyard a beautiful pool area equipped with a little pool house and everything a king could ask for. Now, outside in that pool area, there is a nice kitchen with an ice maker, a full sprinkler system, as well as, of course, a security system. This place was kitted out, suited and booted and beautiful. Now, interestingly enough, we would also learn a little bit more about Ronnie G's behavior during this time, none other from Lucchese soldier, John Panisi. I would urge anyone, John Panisi's put out some good content over the years. Uh, he put out a interesting a run and he had Ronnie G during a beef over Lucchese associate Peter Tuccio to which Ronnie G would allegedly tell John Panisi all sorts of things. They would discuss the purchase of the home and that he had many great plans for it. This is when Ronnie was in construction of the home. He would even at one point call a captain in the Lucchese family, a person called Joe Cafe DeSena, quote, an errand boy. He would also say, quote, fuck Joe Cafe. So Ronnie G was a captain. He was moseying around, uh, asserting his authority. He was on the top of the world. It would all, though, come tumbling down by 2017. The construction of the home was done in and around 2015. But Ronnie G would be done in in March of 2017. He, alongside nine other individuals, would be indicted by the federal government on a wide range of charges in a 53-count indictment, which included loan sharking, extortion, drugs, all sorts of racketeering charges. This was bad for Ronnie G. Ronnie G had to face the real fact that he was going to go away for a long period of time. Look, the truth of the matter is building that home was a major issue, right? We've talked about John Gotti wearing the suits, talking to the media. We've talked about other gangsters, their constant uh, just annoying the government. Ronnie G annoyed the government, right? This is the new age mafia. You build a big home like that, you're going like this to the government. And that's the truth of the matter. But I don't think Ronnie G cared. I think he made a lot of money. He also couldn't report where he made that money, right? Because he would tell the IRS he was making this amount of money, but he's building a huge home in Howard Beach, Queens, right? So it's like you can't you can't make all this money from loan check and drug dealing and not have a legit career, right? Being a, a worker at a deli isn't going to pay the bills, right? So I think he probably put a sticker on his head that said, indict me. And I'm sure looking back as he sits in prison, you know, he should have been a little bit smarter probably. Now, Ronnie G had other issues as well. We have to remember that there were some really damning things in this indictment. At one point, a wiretap was picked up when one of his enforcers and loan shark collectors, Evan Greenberg, described to a customer that he used acts of violence to conduct and collect payments. At one point, Greenberg, who was a member of the crew, an associate would say to a debtor, quote, I get my shit. I blow cars up. I fucking knock on people's doors. I pull them out of their fucking house. I fucking grabbed another kid walking out of the house. I was like, what's up? I say, what's up? I grabbed him by the ankles. I fucking went like this. His head hit the concrete. Pretty damning problems, right? A person in your crew is doing that. Again, these, uh, you know, th this exertion of violence, these doing things to collect exorbitant debts you know, drug dealing, shooting at people like Cagnata. Like, this was all really bad. And the problem also for Gialanza was his old friend Kessler decided to cooperate, who, by the way, was a drug addict, as well as Gene Barello. Gene Barello was problematic because Gene Barello did a lot of things for Ronald Gialanza. He shot people. He beat people up. He collected loan payments. He sold drugs. He ran in people's houses. And all of it was under the guise of, of collecting and flowing money up to Ronald Gialanza. All very problematic. There's a lot of cases and a lot of court um, predicates here to hurt Ronnie G. Ultimately, though, we know the government was obsessed, allegedly, with this home and wanted to take it from Ronnie Gialanza. Now, it has been reported at one point the government would extend a plea bargain to Ronnie Gialanza. They essentially said... They would give him nine years 
as well as he had to sell this home. And also there was some sort of a forfeiture as well. Ultimately in 2018, Ronnie G. Alonzo decided to take a plea bargain. However, he did not get nine years. He would be hit with 14 years in federal prison. He would also have to forfeit about a million dollars as well as sell his beloved home, which he ultimately did. He also was hit with $268,000 in payment of restitution. Now, I will say this. This home uh, was ultimately sold in September of 2018 for $2.6 million. Now, the government contended that the original purchaser of the home was Ronnie G's wife. We can imagine she likely benefited uh, and the government benefited from the sale of that property. Um, I don't know much about Ronnie G's wife, and I'm not going to put her into this because she doesn't really isn't really involved in this. So we don't really need to talk about her. We don't need to talk about the families of these people, really, unless they were involved in criminal acts. We shouldn't be talking about them. And that's something that I think all content creators, at least to me, should do. Ronnie G, as I said, would get the 14 years. He is currently sitting at FCI Allenwood Low in Pennsylvania. He is 53 years old and is scheduled for release in March of 2028. This photo recently surfaced of Ronnie G in prison. Look for a person like Ronald G. Alonzo. He is a lifetime gangster and he will never cooperate, right? Him and his uncle, they're gangsters. That's what they are. We don't know what Ronnie G will do when he gets out of prison, but we can contend. He'll probably go right back to it. That's what these guys do. They're old age gangsters. And a lot of people like Ronnie G, not a lot of people like those exist anymore. Um, Ronnie G is in prison, probably living pretty well. He's got some money. He's got some clout. He's in a low. It's just cost of doing business. And Ronnie G knows that. I hope you enjoyed this video. As always, make sure you check out all my other videos and make sure you hit that like button so we give some money away. Also, check out the link to my podcast in the description below. See you next week here on The Sit Down.